Coming up on DTNS, Facebook banned someone who helped you manage your followers, what Cloudflare discovered during the Facebook outage, and Microsoft backs right to repair. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 8th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Ah, uh, the 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 folks were just talking about raising children uh, on Good Day Internet. I don't know if you'll get any parenting tips. You might get a couple, uh, but you'll want to hear it. It's a good conversation. Get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can join our top patrons like Mark Gibson, Reed Fischler, and Michelle Sergio. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Back in November 2018, two wedding dress manufacturers sued Cloudflare for copyright infringement, arguing that Cloudflare didn't terminate services for websites that infringed on their designs. Well, Judge Vince Chabria of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California has granted Cloudflare's motion for summary judgment in the case, saying simply providing services to a copyright infringer does not qualify as material contribution in determining contributory copyright infringement. And the judge wrote that such services would need to significantly magnify access to infringing content to be found culpable. OnePlus announced on Weibo that OnePlus 9RT and the OnePlus Buds Z2 will launch October 13th at 1930 Beijing time. I believe that is 7.30 p.m. Beijing time. This will likely be a Chinese only launch. All right. Speaking of China, China's state administration for market regulation levied a 3.44 billion yuan fine. That's about the same as 533 million U.S. against the country's leading food delivery firm, Meituan, for violating anti-monopoly regulations. That's about 3% of 2020 domestic revenue. And the company also has to return 1.29 billion yuan in deposits held from exclusivity agreements. However, as bad as that sounds, an even stiffer fine had been expected. So the headlines in South China Morning Post were saying eh, they, they got less than expected. Around 5 a.m. Eastern time on October 8th, background game images on Twitch were replaced with photos of Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos for several hours. This is the first apparent security breach since Twitch's source code and security tools were released online. And YouTube is testing the option of including multiple audio tracks for video, which could be used for multiple languages. Uh, for descriptive audio, which is used for, for people with vision impairments. YouTube also now supports live automatic captions for any live stream that's in English. Previously, it was limited to people with a thousand or more subscribers. Now everybody can do it. Live captions is also coming to the 13 supported auto captioning languages in the coming months. So it'll be more than just English within the next few months. YouTube also plans to launch an experiment later this year that lets users search transcripts on mobile devices. All right, let's talk about Microsoft. Back in June, an investor group called As You Sow filed a shareholder resolution asking Microsoft to examine the impact of making device repair easier. As you saw, is, is one of a series of a bunch of investor groups that are pushing for environmental change. And uh, right to repair is one issue where they feel like you can reduce waste if you make it easier for people to repair stuff. Microsoft, as a result, has now agreed to let independent third parties study the impact of making Microsoft devices easier to repair. Find out what they could do better and make some recommendations. Microsoft says it will use the study's findings as a guide to product design and plans for expanding device repair options. They're going to pay attention. Changes are set to appear in products by the end of 2022. They didn't say what changes they would make. They didn't commit to following every recommendation, but they did say they'd do something by the end of next year. Microsoft will also post a summary of the report so that you can look at it by May of 2022. They are not going to post the full report because of concerns about revealing proprietary information. Microsoft also agreed to make parts and documentation available beyond its authorized repair network by the end of next year and do more to help facilitate local repair. As a result of all these commitments, as you so has withdrawn its shareholder resolution. Uh, but keep in mind, Microsoft has previously lobbied against right to repair laws, particularly in Colorado and Washington. This agreement makes no mention of that. So it'll be interesting to see 
if they stop those activities, and if they don't, if as you so or somebody else comes along and tries to get them to stop doing that. And grist.org, uh, which had the main story about this, notes that similar right to repair resolutions have been filed by another investor group called Green Century Mutual Fund with Apple and John Deere. No, no comments yet from Apple and John Deere on that, but the pressure is on them now, given the example that Microsoft is showing. Rob, it's a lot of talk right now. We haven't seen them do anything. What do you make of this? So for me, I actually like the fact that they are saying that they may do something. For, for you know, when, when I got back into IT, you know, back in the '80s, part of the reason was because I could pull computers apart, I could put them together, I could take this piece from here and put it there. If this thing burned out, I could replace it myself without having to go buy a new PC. And just slowly but surely over the years, the you know the ability to do that has gone away. And I'm not just talking about the you know the you know the major things. You, you can't even replace batteries in laptops anymore. Sometimes it's like you have to take it to an authorized reseller to get things like that done. So the fact that they are at least going to look at the data, they, they haven't made any uh, you know any commitments to doing anything other than looking at the data. But at least that's a start because. You shouldn't have to go to Microsoft to get something as simple as a new hard drive, as something as, you know, your screen cracked. Do you have to go to Microsoft to get that fixed? You know, you should be able to go other places that might be more economical depending on where you are in the world. Yeah, I, I, I get the argument. Uh, as much as I, I, I am a, of a like mind with you, that I would prefer that everything would be repairable by me. I may not want to always repair it, but I'd like it to be repairable by me or someone I choose rather than having to go to a manufacturer because that that makes it cheaper, it lets me shop around. But I also get that sometimes the design is better when it's not repairable, that you, you might get a slimmer device, a more portable device. So what I like here is that Microsoft is like, advise us on the design, we may not make a decision in every case to make it more re re repairable, but at least we can have a conversation about why that is now, right? And if, if Microsoft is saying, well, we wanted to keep this slim or lightweight or something, I can decide like, oh, okay, you know, that's worth it for me for that. Or I can say, no, I, I want the more repairable version. But this kind of dialogue around this, this kind of saying, let's have an independent third party look at this. Let's have somebody else advise us and then let the company, you know, don't don't force their hand, but let the company make the decision. Then we as the consumers can judge what we think of those decisions. Yeah, and and just having that third party and, you know, kind of working in concert, it's a, it's a synergy. So, okay, here's things that just because of the physical design, we cannot make this something that everybody or anybody could just go to the parts store, grab a part and replace. Um, but for this, we can. So, like I said, I'm just happy that they're at least willing to have the conversation. They're willing to listen and see where things go. Yeah. And uh, hopefully there'll be some some good design advice from the third party. I don't know what the third party is going to be. But, you know, somebody like iFixit could very easily uh, come in and say, like, hey, you can keep it thin and light with a couple of screws. And it'll, it'll be right. a whole lot more repairable. Yeah. Screws instead glue. of glue. You yeah, know, you didn't have right? you could have used a screw instead of glue. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you may not realize this, but some S, uh, but some SMS can't handle group chats, video, audio, high resolution images or read receipts. Now, I know some of you are objecting, saying that your SM app does do this, and it probably does. In the case of Apple, it does this by using Apple's own proprietary system, which doesn't work for anybody outside of the Apple ecosystem. For Android, it uses something called RCS. This is why things like group chats and sending video don't work when you try to text between Android and Apple devices. It's one reason why people use platform independent systems like WeChat and WhatsApp Messenger. And this is the tech reality behind a story in Golf Digest that makes light of the fact that pro golfer Bison Jashambo is always breaking iMessage chats with the green bubble because he uses Android. <laughs> the official Android Twitter account tweeted this story out um, on you know, Google, um, and Google SVP Hiroshi Lockheimer replied, group chats don't need to break like this. There exists a really clear solution. He's probably alluding to RCS. Here's an open invitation to the folks who make who can make this right and we're here to help. No, the translation is that the folks are Apple and the folks who can make it right are Google. So <laughs> this was one that a story that actually I kind of chuckled when I read it, but you know I, I wonder what is Apple eventually going to do because I know that I believe that next year, um 2022, that's when Verizon, at least here in the states Verizon, uh um 
T-Mobile and uh, AT&T have all agreed that they're going to start using the Android Messages app and using RCS as their primary mode of communication. I don't see Apple moving over to this anytime soon, even with Google's help. So it just kind of makes me wonder, what what is the world going to look like in a year, in two years, when everyone is using either iOS devices or Android devices, but they don't really talk well to each other? Yeah. Um, is you know is Apple potentially going to damage a little bit of their share? Because I, I know in the UK, WhatsApp Messenger is king there, even if you are using a you know an iOS device. So I'm just kind of wondering. How is this going to ultimately play out when the rest of us moves over to RCS and ICS and, and Apple is still kind of stuck on, nope, it needs to be iMessage or you're just going to get SMS? Well, but that's also the way it is right now. I mean, what yeah. what is the rest what is the rest of the world outside of Apple? It's Android, right? So you're kind of already dealing with that world and Apple's just like, mm, I don't know. I guess we're fine with that. I mean, in the epic Apple case, there were some emails that Epic dragged out to show that Apple considered making iMessage available on other platforms and then was worried about it making it too easy to switch. So I feel like Apple looks at this and says, hey, the harder it is to message with people on Android, the better for us, the better it is to keep people in our ecosystem. I don't agree, but I feel like that's the way Apple looks at it. And I think the only thing that changes that is if the carriers put pressure, because the carriers support SMS and the carriers now support RCS. And if the carriers are saying, hey, we're not gonna support SMS anymore you know, for long, we're gonna move everything to RCS. I know it's backwards compatible, but if you really wanna be like cutting edge compliant with our systems, you need to support RCS. I could see that being the only way Apple switches. And I wonder if that's going to be the thing that makes them switch, because I know that, uh, you know, going way back in the day when there was this thing called a BlackBerry that uh, people don't remember, it had a great system on there called BlackBerry Messenger. And people would literally buy Blackberries just so they could have conversations with other people who have Blackberries. I don't know that that's happening with the iPhone any longer. In fact, there may be, even be some chinks in that armor because Apple recently set it up so that you can at least participate in an iMessages uh, type conversation. You can't initiate it, but you can at least participate. Um, through a web service on an Android device. So I'm just wondering, are they just going to hold out as long as they can? And then if the standard, because it's not a standard, this is just what they're going with. If it becomes the standard, do they actually move at some point later? Yeah. Well, and RCS is a standard. It's just not a standard that that Apple supports. In fact, if you want to know a little more about that, uh, and how Google fits in, how the carriers fits in, uh, we have an episode explaining all about RCS coming to know a little more next week. Uh, we mentioned Cloudflare earlier. Uh, Cloudflare, mostly known for for helping uh, keep companies' websites up, keep their networks running. Uh, but one of the things it does is operate a DNS server at 1.1.1.1. Uh, it handles a big chunk of internet traffic because the, the deal is Cloudflare does this to kind of get you to know who they are and trust them, but it's a privacy-oriented DNS server. So it looked at the data of, from the Facebook outage to see what effect it had not only on Cloudflare's own services, but the internet in general, because a big chunk of the internet's going through 1.1.1.1. As we explained earlier this week, Facebook's systems were answering requests for facebook.com with what's called a serve fail. Uh, you can go back to Tuesday's episode if you really want to understand this, but it basically said, we don't have a server at facebook.com, sorry, and it would send serve fail. So Cloudflare tracked the incidences of serve fail because the number of serve fails coming from attempts to reach Facebook vastly outnumbered the normal number of serve fails on any given day, you could use them as a proxy for the number of people trying to reach Facebook. WhatsApp and Instagram as well, right? So if you got a serve fail, the chances are somebody was probably trying to reach one of those domains. You didn't have to spy on what domain they were after. Cloudflare took that number and broke it down by country. The nation trying hardest to get to Facebook properties, at least through Cloudflare's DNS on Monday, was Turkey, followed by Granada, Congo, Lesotho, and Nicaragua. Probably not the, the countries you would have expected, huh, Rob? Absolutely not. When I first heard that, I'm like, what? why is it not the big, giant countries with hundreds of millions, if not billions, of 
um, inhabitants are the ones who are doing this most. But then I thought about it. These are the places where WhatsApp rules. You know, WhatsApp is the communication platform. So, um, you know, here in the States, people have WhatsApp, but they still call people. They still actually send SMS or, or iMessage. They still do those things. Um, in these countries, WhatsApp is the thing. So that there's just an enormous amount of traffic that's going specifically for WhatsApp in these places. Yeah, probably a big chunk of it. The other thing I thought of, 1.1.1.1 uh, is promoted as privacy protecting. And if you look at the list, the full list of the top countries, a lot of those contain people who might be concerned about governments looking in on their internet traffic and might want to use 1.1.1.1 as a way to protect that. So there may be a sample bias there too, of you know the the you know you and I might be fine using 8.8.8.8 from Google or whatever DNS our ISP gives. Maybe people in these countries are just more likely to want to use Cloudflare's DNS. That, that, that actually makes an enormous amount of sense as well, because if they're going to protect what you're sending through tweets, I mean, you know, we, we kind of take our freedoms for granted here in the United States. You know, we always, you know, if, you, if somebody censors you just a little bit, you're going to say it's freedom of speech. It's not always freedom of speech. In fact, it's usually not. But in some of these other countries, the freedom to speak is actually, uh, you know, limited in many ways. So you're right. They may be going through just because they get a layer of protection through Cloudflare as compared to other ISP, not ISPs, but other DNS hosts. But other DNS, yeah. A few other interesting tidbits they found. Uh, as you might expect, traffic jumped to other messaging and social media sites during the outage, uh, but also jumped to gaming and news sites. Probably people, you know, taking some extra time, like, well, I would have spent this on Facebook, I'll, I'll play a game, or trying to figure out why Facebook is down. There was no evidence of increased attacks from malicious hackers during the outage. Uh, another interesting bit, Facebook crawls the web collecting information, just like Google does, uh, you know, trying to do a search index for the Facebook graph. You would expect that traffic would drop from Facebook to zero. It didn't. It dropped to about 30% of normal Facebook traffic. And the answer why is liars. The user agent string in a browser can be set to anything. Yeah, lots of bots out there are identifying themselves as Facebook. Clearly about 30% of them are not Facebook who say they are Facebook. Yeah, if people are looking to see where your stuff is coming from, say Facebook, you probably don't think second you know, or third time about it. That's actually kind of smart by some of these other companies that are saying Facebook when they really aren't. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, uh, if you would like to expand your Spanish tech skills, one great way of doing that is listening to NTX, Noticias de Tecnología Express with Dan Campos. In fact, Dan Campos is here to help you with one more word to add to your vocabulary. Hello, friends of DTNS. It is time for the word of the day, brought to you by Noticias de Tecnología Express. Today's word is barbaridad. It doesn't have a proper translation in English and can mean different things. First, you can use it to refer to excessive quantities. If there is a lot of something, es una barbaridad. Second, you can use it to indicate when someone says something that makes no sense, like when a public figure is posting barbaridades on Twitter. Finally, you can also use it to express admiration or surprise. ¡Qué barbaridad! You can learn this and more words by listening to Noticias de Tecnología Express, available every Friday. Now, you may find Facebook's attitude here uh, a bunch of barbaridades, uh, but Luis Barclay created a browser extension called Unfollow Everything, letting users unfollow all their friends, groups, and pages at once. Facebook makes you do it one by one. This extension just automated that and said, hey, if you want to clear your news feed, this will do it. Because once you're unfollowed everybody, then you can go check in on friends directly when you want to see what they have to say. You can go to groups when you want to see what they have to say, but you wouldn't get it all in your news feed. And Lewis Barkley did this first for himself to help uh, reduce the habit of using Facebook and then made it available for others. Barkley also says he helped the Swiss University of Neuchâtel use the extension to help them study the effect of the news feed on people's well-being. It was an easy way for them to say, okay, we're going to turn off your news feed and see what happens. Barkley published an article in Slate on Friday saying Facebook sent him a cease and desist letter earlier this year claiming the extension violated Facebook terms of service by creating software that automated user interactions. Barkley also said Facebook permanently disabled his Facebook and Instagram accounts and demanded that he, quote, never again create tools that interact with Facebook or its other services. Now, 
he could have fought them in court. He even had some some public interest groups willing to help him defend himself. But Facebook had a lot more resources to fight this out than Barkley, so he removed the tool. And he probably would have lost. It's not guaranteed, uh, but Facebook's terms of service do clearly prohibit this kind of tool. There's not a real question of whether Facebook had the right to do this so much as could they have handled it another way? Rob, sh should they have done this? They, they could have handled it a different way. They definitely have the right to do exactly what they did. This is against their terms of service. But this ultimately could affect their bottom line. They absolutely know every signal that they get from all the people that you're following and all the interactions that you have based off the things that are showing up in your feed based off of who you're following. When you go through and clear all of that, those signals are lost. Your time on Facebook goes down you make Facebook ultimately ends up making less money. So I, it's a business decision for them, you know, in my opinion, as to why they are doing this, they do give you the ability to do this one by one. But if you've got hundreds of, you know, people that you're following, you're probably not going to sit there for hours and just click unfollow, go to the next account, unfollow, go to the next account, unfollow. So this is in their interest financially, not to allow this to happen they probably should build this into their back end system to give you a way to do this. There's, there should be some unfollow all button that they, that they go put in there because if they don't, people are going to be looking at them side eyes like, eh, you're trying to make money off of me. And this doesn't really help them with everything else that's going on with Facebook right now. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a very clear case of user antagonism. Uh, there, there are some legal reasons why even if you wanted to have this extension out there, you probably shouldn't if it violates your terms of service because then somebody else could come in and like, well, you let that extension go. Why can't you let my extension go? I get that. So hire the guy. I, I, trust me, I know Facebook doesn't want this extension to work because of what you said about monetization. But let's pretend Facebook was actually not anti-user and was like, oh yeah, no, this is a useful tool. Uh, we want to help the University of Neuchatel. Uh, let's hire you on a contract uh, to help us integrate this extension in our system. We can't let you do it outside of our terms and service, but let, let's make this an option, like you said, Rob. Make it, make it so that that people can just do this if they need to do it. They absolutely I'm won't do that, but that's how I think it should have been handled. I'm cynical enough to believe that somebody who counts things at Facebook said, what's going to be worse? The social media hit that we take if we just kick this guy off? Or the social media gain that we gain by bringing him in and they yeah. weigh that. And it's like, no, we don't make more money doing it the second way. Let's just go ahead and just kick them off. That's what's easiest. And sadly, people are so angry about Facebook for everything. This is why I, I am always cautioning, like, don't get mad at them for everything because when they do do something that's worth getting mad about, they won't care because they're like, yeah, people are used to everyone being mad at us. So they won't notice. And that's what's going on here is you've been mad about Facebook for every little thing for so long that Facebook is, immune to it now because everybody because the people who would be swayed are like eh, people get mad at facebook for everything these days and they don't care yeah they, they don't so they, i think they missed an opportunity here yeah i do too but it, it's facebook so you kind of just expect some of this stuff but let's talk about wrong things that roll so airless tires are technology that made off-road vehicles have made it off-road vehicles but it has yet to be approved for use on the street the promise of an airless tire is great. If your tire doesn't need air, then you don't need to worry about nails or sidewall slashes, spare tires, jacks, inflation kits, and most of all, crashing because of a blowout. The hurdles to adoption are making them light enough, quiet enough, and roll smoothly enough um, that you're just not going to have a bumpy ride. CNET's Brian Cooley notes that Michelin and GM plan to have airless tires available for street use as early as 2024. The tires are called Michelin Updis, which stands for Unique Puncture Proof Tire Systems. They are see-through since a series of glass fiber reinforced plastic veins support the tread. There's no air. Unlike a lot of previous demo airless tires, Michelin GM are working on government approval. So this thing might actually come to market. I don't know. I, with airless tires are not something we cover all that often uh, on, on DTNS, but it really reminds me of batteries. Where you're like, ooh, this is this is the battery tech that's going to improve things, and and it's it's going to come to market in the next five years. It's always five years out. We're going to have this battery tech, and it never ever arrives. And we're stuck with lithium-ion batteries forever. Uh, 2024 is a little closer. It's only three years out. 
it's I wish they had said by 2024 instead of as early as 2024, because that makes me think that they're hedging their bets a little about making this practical. But I do take heart uh, that this was shown off uh, in Munich at the auto show earlier in September. So people actually got to drive it around. And most said I felt like it would handled like a regular tire. I was I was just driving around. That was the big question for me. Do they feel and act like regular tires? The second question is, how much more do these cost? Um, you know, will they last longer? I don't imagine that GM or GM, that, that Goodyear or Michelin are going to make tires that just last forever. Um, they kind of know that you're getting new tires every three to five years, depending on how many miles you drive. Are you going to get roughly the same mileage with this? Uh, you know, th those are the kind of questions that I'm looking at after I know that they handle the same, they drive the same. I don't hear you know, a ton of, you know, uh, street noise, uh, you know, you know, coming through the car. Those are the kind of things, you know, that I care about. You know, they're tires, you know, they've been doing this for hundreds of years. So, you know, why, why change now? If they're better, if they're more eco-friendly, if they cause less accidents, I'm all for it, but I don't want them to just be another way to suck money out of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the hedge against that is competition, which with tire makers, I think you might have enough competition and other sources of revenue. If if the company's only source of revenue is the tires, then you're right. The pressure is going to be to like, mm, don't do that. We'll lose all our revenue. But Michelin makes a lot of other stuff. It's a huge company. Uh, and so as long as it can can bring you along, it'll want to win the business from from others. It'll want to outcompete them by putting out the better tire because Whoever makes a tire where you're like, this will last the life of your car, everyone will flock and buy it. Uh, and everybody knows that. So uh, that's, that's. Uh, I mean, let's get a tire that actually works out there, but, uh, you know, can before we, before we start worrying about how long it'll go. But I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. hopeful that that'll work. Yeah, tires, good ones, they're not inexpensive. Um, mm -hmm. But I, it's, it's built in for decades upon decades. People are used to every 35,000, 50,000 miles, I have to go get a new set of these. So yep. if they last longer, that is a boon. But they can't, you know, they can't last twice as long but cost four times as much. That math just doesn't work out. Yeah, yeah. All right, finally, bands are getting ready to return to concerts, and the chip shortage is hitting one aspect of concert going pretty hard. Folks from my generation are familiar with holding up a cigarette lighter to show appreciation, ask for an encore. Uh, you, you, somebody in the millennial generation might might hold one of those emergency little glow sticks. Ah, but the younger concert goers, you Gen Zers out there, especially for K-pop and Mando pop groups, use light sticks. These are cool. They have chips in them. Tours often feature new designs to go with new songs and new albums. They pair with your smartphone so you can do custom things like change the colors and the flashing patterns and more. And to do that and to manage the power, as I mentioned, they have chips. And as we all know, it's hard enough to get chips for things these days, especially since these are low-end chips. That's the key. Like the display chips in cars, you just need simple chips. And simple chips are facing the biggest shortages because there's a limited number of factories. And nobody wants to build a new factory to make a simple chip. No one wants to get rid of a more complex chip to make way on a fab for a simple chip. And so we see a chip shortage in cars. And that means light sticks are seeing a huge price jump because they can't get the chips. Fans of BTS are called ARMY, and ARMY's light sticks are called ARMY bombs, and a typical ARMY bomb light stick on the official Weaver shop has increased by two bucks as of October 1st. Fans of the band 17 now pay $3 more, and that's if you can get them. Fan lights for the band twice sold out almost immediately after they announced their tour, and if you're into EXO or SHINee or Girls' Generation or Blackpink, you just can't buy one. Sorry, Blinks, no chips in your area. Uh, I thought this was fascinating because I think it's these little things that use chips that we don't think of in the chip shortage that are going to start popping up more and more. Yeah, it's it, you, you really don't. It's a, a light stick. You just think it's just a light stick. But no, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a piece of electric gadgetry that these things actually compare to your phone. So there's there's a lot of tech in these throwaway light sticks that people are buying. But I see this just as an opportunity for someone to figure out an app that will just do this on the screen 
of your phone because everything that all of these, uh, you know, all, all of these millennials have when they're going to these concerts, they have their phones as well. And your phone can put out some pretty bright light. So instead of having the glow stick, you basically just have an app that does it on your phone. I think that might solve this issue. And you're probably going to see if there aren't already apps that will start doing that. You, you link them up, you get an email address, you know, there's probably marketing that the uh, bands can do if they can get you to download an app so you can actually coordinate with their show. Although you still don't get to put that army bomb in your collection later. Yeah, you know, that is that's, true. That's the problem. That's the problem. But yeah, that might, that might be the thing to, to tide people over. Hey, keep those emails coming folks. We love to hear from you. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And thanks to our brand new boss. We keep the streak alive of brand new bosses. James uh, was uh, the person who snagged the mention today. Thank you, James. <laughs> Just started backing us on Patreon. Uh, folks, you can, get, uh, you can get the limelight all to yourself if you're listening out there on the free feed. You don't have to be listening to those ads. You can get extra stuff. You can get to know a little more in your feed. All of that just by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us, Len? So uh, I deal with this in my own family, which is the, the dreaded uh, green uh, texter. We are an, mm. um, you know, we are an iPhone family, and uh, we use that. So uh, this, I, I, I felt this was worthy of of, of drawing. I feel there's this um, discrimination against yeah. green, uh, and I, I don't agree with it. I think it's terrible. And uh, this piece is called text discrimination. I can't take. Uh, credit for that great title. It's Kepper67 at my Twitch that did that. Um, but it does. It shows um, some some blues beaten up on a green. And it's like the greens don't deserve to be treated like this. No. So I, I hope there's something that can be figured out uh, so that we can all chat and share information with one another freely and without discrimination. So that's my PSA for today. This image is available right now at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. Also just want to mention on Monday, 9.30 p.m. on my Twitch channel, Twitch uh, uh, Len Peralta, uh, The Draw, episode four of The Draw. So make sure you check oh, it out. Good. Excellent. It truly is not easy being green. It is not. Oh, that's even a better title. <laughs> oh, man. Ah, Rob right. Dunwood, uh, what do you know about being the green person in a texting chat? Um, so most of my family are Android. So it's the opposite for us. Uh, and I, I regularly tell my family members who have switched over to iPhone and ask me tech questions. You've gone against the family. I can't help you. <laughs> so I, I may be part of the problem, Lynn. I got you. It's the I got other you. way. Hey, uh, what do you got going on to tell folks about before we get out of here? Folks, I've got a brand new podcast called The Tech John that I would love if you go check it out. So head over to thetechjohn.com, and that is J-A-W-N, The Tech John. And uh, we're talking about tech with a couple of buddies of mine, and you're going to hear different opinions in which you normally hear um, you know, on tech shows. But I think you really would enjoy it, so go check it out, thetechjohn.com. Yeah, yeah, check it out. It's Rob. It's Terrence Gaines, a.k.a. Brother Tech, who, who joins us from time to time. And Tech Life Steph. Stephanie Humphrey, she's going to be on the show on Monday. You're going to get a going to get a good look at the tech. Tuesday, John. Tuesday, yeah. you're off Monday. Oh, we're off on Monday, so she'll be here on Tuesday. That's right. No, that's good. Uh, so anyway, folks, don't forget we're live usually Monday, but sometimes Tuesday through Friday at 4:30 p.m. Eastern, 20:30 UTC. Find out more at DailyTechNewsShow.com/live. Like Rob said, we're off Monday, but we will be here Tuesday with Stephanie Humphrey. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Creative Ast Arts. Art and live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Rob Dunwood. 
Guests on this week's show included Nate Langson, Molly Wood, and Stacey Higginbotham. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>